Welcome to our very informal question and answer session where we deal with questions that are not covered in our seminar on creation evolution. Uh, for those just getting this material, my name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years and now do seminars on creation and evolution. Since early 1989, I've been doing this. The Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, he said, I applied my heart to know and to seek and to, to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things. 1 Peter chapter 3 tells us that we should be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that's in us. I think it's good for Christians to study the truth so that they can give an answer to those that are not Christians. And it's good for those of you that are not Christians to study the truth so that you can become Christians. When you get to the top of the mountain of truth, you'll find the Christians were sitting there all along. Uh, God's word is truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible tells us we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, in this session, we're going to deal with quite a few miscellaneous questions. If you have questions that are not covered here or elsewhere in the seminar, feel free to send them in. We'll try to deal with them as time permits on our website, drdino.com, or on our radio program, or possibly in a future edition of our question answer tapes. One question I often get when I say I believe in creation, they're going to say, oh, wait a minute, all scientists believe in evolution. Well, that's simply not true, okay? The vast majority of scientists may believe, or some the majority of scientists may believe in evolution, but it depends on what you mean by evolution. But all scientists do not believe in evolution. And even if they did, that's not how you determine truth. It is possible for the majority to be wrong. History shows us there are many times when the majority is wrong. The majority of scientists used to teach that all the planets go around the Earth. That is wrong, as far as we know. By the way, there's still some folks who believe in the geocentric theory. I don't fight them, I disagree with them, but. Uh, there are really some surprising number of folks who believe in the geocentric theory. But for years, many people thought, the majority of people taught, that the heavy objects fall faster than lighter objects. That was taught for 2,000 years, and it's wrong. It's not true. For many years, it was taught if you're sick, you have bad blood. Take out your blood, and you'll get better. That is simply wrong. It's not true. There were places all over the country to get your blood taken out. They had little white poles out front with a red stripe around it. The barber was the blood letter. So, even if a majority of scientists do believe something, that doesn't make it true. Let me give you an example here from the book of John, chapter 7. The people, therefore, were, they were arguing about Christ, and they said, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David, out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? Here's the Hovind translation. They're arguing about the wrong subject. They were arguing, should Christ come out of Bethlehem or Galilee? And they thought Jesus came from Galilee, so he can't be the Christ. They didn't realize he came from Bethlehem. So he, he was the Christ, obviously. And he did come from Bethlehem, but he was raised in Galilee. In John chapter 7, it says, There was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hold on him. What I get from this verse is, if you don't like somebody, if you don't like their message, kill the messenger. And this you see a lot in the creation evolution uh, arguments. If you watch some of my debates, I've had over 80 debates now at universities. Oftentimes they get so angry at me because of what I'm saying. Uh, I'm just delivering a message. I'm just telling you what the truth is from science and what God's Word says. Don't get angry at me. There are folks, there are over 500 anti hovind websites. They really don't like me. And they all want to get me into an email debate. And then they say, I won't debate them. I won't get an email debate them, but I'll debate them publicly anytime, anywhere. Uh, I don't have time for an email debate. I type 12 words a minute with 19 mistakes. I simply don't have time, okay? Yeah, we have run a real busy ship around here. The next verse says, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? Now get the picture here. The Pharisees sent, their off, sent the officers off to, catch, to get Jesus, and then they came back without him, and they said, Why didn't you get him? And the officers said, Never man spake like this man. Here's the Hovind translation. The professors sent their students off to ask the heretic questions, but they didn't, the professors didn't go themselves. I get this a lot. I'll speak at universities. The professor doesn't show up uh, to, answer que to ask questions, but he sends his students with a list of questions. And you'll see the student pull out a list of questions, and they're going to trip up Hovind on something, you know. So they ask me their questions, and I answer all of them. And then they go back and tell their professor, well, he answered all my questions. And the professor says, well, you should have asked him this and this and this. Oh, you coward, you should have come yourself, professor. Don't send your students off to do your dirty work. If you got a question, give me a call. What I also get from this verse is the Pharisees decided they're going to use the law. They're going to legally try to stop this guy from sharing this message. They wanted to shut Jesus up. 
And there are people who will use legal tactics to try to shut up the Christians. They try to exclude Christianity from public schools. They can't handle the message, so they shut down the message so people don't get a chance to hear it. And that's what I see in John chapter uh, 7. Then answered them, the Pharisees, are ye also deceived? The Pharisees are saying, are you stupid? Then they said, have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him? Notice this, their evidence that Jesus could not be the Messiah was because they didn't believe he was the Messiah. Therefore, he can't be because we don't believe he is. You get the same kind of logic with some of these professors in colleges. They'll say, well, all scientists believe in evolution, therefore it must be true. <laughs> That's ridiculous, okay? They don't all believe in it, and even if they did, that doesn't make it true. You can see the same parallel 2,000 years ago in the book of John. Then the Pharisees said, this people who know not the law are cursed. Here's the Hovind translation of this verse. We have knowledge, you don't. We don't approve of your degree. You're ignorant if you don't believe in evolution. And you'll see this a lot in the creation evolution argument. They'll say, we're smart, everybody else is dumb. I get this a lot when I do debates. They'll say, well, the average person in the audience probably doesn't understand the complexity of this topic. And I'll say, folks, what he's trying to tell you is, you're dumb, he's smart. And that's precisely what they're trying to, trying to say in a subtle way. The next verse, verse 50 says, Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went to his own house. Even some of the non-believers were smart enough to realize this guy's telling the truth. And we get people by the thousands that write our ministry or call us and say, Look, I was not a believer, but I saw your material on creation, and I'm convinced creation is true. And that's what we're trying to do. We want to convince you that God's word is true. The whole argument here in John 7 started with a false assumption that Jesus came out of Galilee. Okay, they're arguing about the wrong topic. The Pharisees didn't believe in him, so they said, that's proof he can't be the Christ because we don't believe him. If he was, we would believe in him. That's silly. That's the same thing you used to get today. Skeptics will say, well, has Hovind or any of these, have any of these creationists published in science journals? And when they say no, they'll say, see, that proves, that proves he can't be right. <laughs> that's their logic, okay? It doesn't take a few seconds to think how dumb that is. First place, creationist material is routinely excluded from creation from science journals because from I should say science journals because they've started with a definition that science cannot include the supernatural. Therefore, if your explanation isn't 100% natural, it's not science. Therefore, creation is by definition not science. That's their thinking. They don't realize evolution is not science. Evolution is based purely on the assumption that things happen. It's never observed or tested or demonstrated in the laboratory. It's purely religious. The majority can often be wrong. The majority followed Aaron in rebellion in Exodus chapter 32. The majority voted not to go into the Promised Land in Numbers chapter 32. The majority followed false gods many times throughout the Old Testament. Read through it and you'll see. The majority was wrong. The majority of religious leaders hated Jesus. The majority of the world hates Christians. So it is not true that all Christians, all scientists believe in evolution. If it were, that wouldn't matter. Okay. And you don't determine truth that way. But let me share with you a few Christians who are scientists, who are strong believers in creation, and who are also very brilliant scientists. Robert Gentry, a friend of mine from uh, Tennessee, is a brilliant scientist when it comes to radioactive material and the disposal of radioactive waste. He worked at Oak Ridge Laboratories. He published this book here, Creation's Tiny Mysteries. Excellent book about radio polonium halos. You can get it through our ministry in our bookstore or on our website. Robert Gentry was doing tremendous work. It was published in many major science journals about radio polonium halos being found in granites all over the world. I went and met with Robert Gentry, saw, his, saw the polonium halo through the microscope in his laboratory, and everybody was fine until they realized, wow, his research proves the Big Bang Theory is not true. And boy, they shut off his funding and his grant money in a hurry. He uh, finally uh, said, well, we don't, we don't have a job for you anymore, just because his research was supporting creation. Talk to Robert Gentry up in uh, Halo at go to www.halos.com and see for yourself. Doctor, uh, uh, sorry, Roger DeHart was a science teacher in uh, near Seattle, Washington. He was told he could not inform his students of errors in the textbooks. Here they've got textbooks with mistakes in them, but he couldn't tell the students about the mistakes because if they, those mistakes were used to support the evolution theory. He said they said you can't even pass out current science journals to inform students of mistakes in the textbooks. That's not science. That's that, uh, you know, burn the heretic attitude that some people get, or go burn the witch, you know. And there's, a, talk about a witch hunt. The evolutionists are on a witch hunt against the creationists in the public schools. They will try desperately to get them fired from their job. 
Kevin Haley was a biology teacher at Central Oregon Community College in Bend, Oregon. He lost his job simply because he was exposing errors in the textbooks. He'd say, kids, the information on page 87 has been proven wrong. Disregard that. That won't be on the test. And he's right. It was proven wrong. I debated one professor one time, and I gave out like 20 or 30 lies in the textbooks, and he got up and said, now, folks, Hovind's right. All these things are not true. But he said, Hovind, I got a question. What are you going to replace all this with? <laughs> in other words, we can't take the lies out of the books until I find a replacement. In other words, I've got to provide evidence for his theory, or else we can't take the lies out of the books. Talk about dumb. Uh, that's not the way science works, okay? You teach the kids the truth. Just teach the truth, okay? And if all you have are lies to back up your theory, then get a new theory. In uh, Texas, Baylor University fired William Dembski just because he advocated that there might be an intelligent designer. Oh, that's heresy. There could be a designer. You're out of here. You're fired. Forrest Mims was a science writer for 20 years. He published in National Geographic, Science Digest, American Journal of Physics, over 60 magazines and newspapers. He was denied a job as science writer for Scientific American simply because he was a creationist. They didn't want to have a creationist on their staff. Teacher Rod Levesque was told he could not uh, share information that might help students doubt Darwin's theory. See, Darwin's theory is sacred. You don't question it without losing your job in many school systems. Okay? The same thing happened in Russia 10, 15 years ago. If a teacher got up in their class and said, kids, I don't believe communism works, <laughs> he'd be out of a job and maybe out of the country or out of this life. They'd kill him or send him off to Siberia. You get the same kind of academic Siberia people sent off to academic Siberia if they don't support the evolution theory right here in America, the land of the fee and the home of the slave. Mr. Uh, Eller told his teacher Dan Clark in Lafayette, Indiana, Mr. Eller was the uh, superintendent, that he could not introduce creationism to his class. So uh, Dan Clark resigned. He quit. Many good teachers are dropping out of the public school system because they're not allowed to teach kids the truth. The problem is not the law. The law says you can teach creation. Not a problem to teach creation legally. The courts have ruled it's okay to teach creation, but the boss says don't do it. The ACLU, which is the American Communist Lawyers Union, they learned years ago all they have to do is threaten to sue and the school will back down. Even though the ACLU knows they will lose the suit, doesn't matter, the threat of a suit is enough to make it the, teacher, the teachers get fired. Just the threat of a suit. And so that's what's happening. We're losing by default. They're not even putting up a good fight. Dean Kenyon was a professor at uh, San Francisco State University in San Francisco. He wrote uh, many books about evolution. He was the poster boy for the evolutionist. He was a strong believer in the theory. And one day he got converted and began to believe in creation. And they fired him. He sued. They put him back in as a lab assistant, you know, washing test tubes, which the students do normally. And here's a guy, 20-year, I believe, tenured professor. Finally, after a long battle, he was reinstated with his job. But if he hadn't been tenured, he wouldn't have kept his job. That's what happened to Dean Kenyon. He wrote the book Of Pandas and People, which you can get through our ministry. Uh, Dr. Denny at uh, Texas Tech University had on his website for years that if you wanted to get recommended for medical school, he's from Lubbock, Texas, that you had to confess to believing in evolution. If you don't believe in evolution, you, he's not going to recommend you for medical school. When I spoke in Lubbock, Texas in the fall of 2002, the students there got together and offered Denny $900 if he would debate me. He refused. He wouldn't debate for two hours for 900 bucks. I don't know how much he makes an hour, but I suspect it's not quite that much. So, Mr. Denny, I'll come anytime, anywhere, and take you on intellectually in a debate on creation evolution. Evolution is one of the dumbest ideas in the history of humanity, and the devil is laughing at you for believing in that silly theory. And it's, if you don't trust Christ, you're going to go to hell. I'm not your enemy. I'm your friend. I don't want to see you go to hell. I'd like to see you get converted. But what you're doing is unfair and certainly unwise and, I think, un-American to require a student to believe a certain religion and all you have is a religious worldview of evolution and you require students to believe that before you give them a recommendation letter. Come on, grow up. Let kids learn the truth. We can go on and on how people are discriminated against by, because of their belief in creation. Uh, Patrick Henry College was notified they were going to deny their uh, recommendation uh, to be accredited simply because they didn't believe in evolution. We'll have lots of information on our website about how students or universities or teachers are discriminated against because of their belief in creation. Now, it wasn't always this way. If you go back in the past, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, all the scientists believed in creation. Here's a list of quite a few scientists, Francis Bacon, Johann Kepler, uh, Blaise Pascal, Robert Boyle, uh, Isaac Newton. These guys were the founders of major branches of science, Carolus Linnaeus, and they were creationists. George Cuvier, um, 
on and on the list goes of hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of very famous scientists who were creationists. Not always young earth creationists, but certainly creationists. And many were young earth creationists. Uh, Richard Owen, Louis Agassi, um, James Jewell. All you got to do is notice, folks, the many, nearly all branches of science are started by people who believed in creation, not people who believed in evolution. The evolutionists don't come up with anything. They don't create anything. They come in and take over an institution that's already going. And many Christian colleges have been taken over by evolutionists. Harvard, Princeton, Yale started off as Christian schools. And now they've been taken over by those who believe in evolution. The evolutionists don't go start something. They just take over like a leech, you know, or a tick or a parasite, what somebody else has already created. Uh, Werner von Braun, a space scientist, was a strong believer in creation. Um, there are many books out. There's a good book in six days, 50, Why 50 Scientists Chose to Believe in Creation. There are quite a few books on this topic. You can see our website, drdino.com, and get more. Okay, next question. What about separation of church and state? Is it okay to discuss creation in public schools? Well, first place, the phrase separation of church and state is not found in the Constitution. Don't let somebody tell you that the, const the law says it has to be a separation of church and state. That's baloney. That phrase was used by Thomas Jefferson in a letter that he wrote to some pastors in the Danbury Association, a Baptist association in Connecticut. He's the one that said, the First Amendment has erected a wall of separation between church and state. Thomas Jefferson said that. It's not in the Constitution. And by the way, if there's a wall between the two, it's a one-dimensional wall. It keeps the government out of the church. It, does not, it was not designed to keep the church out of the government. So there's no such thing as separation of church and state found in the Constitution. The fact of the matter is the Founding Fathers, when they gave the First Amendment, Article 1, the same day, I believe, voted to give, I think, seven or ten or fifteen thousand dollars, something, to a mission in uh, St. Louis to help some, a Catholic mission reach the Indians there with what they thought was the gospel. Um, so you just go through the history, go to wallbuilders.com, David Barton's excellent website, and get some of his material, and you can see how that the Founding Fathers were certainly strong believers in creation and had no intention of the government getting involved in the church, but they had every intention of the church getting involved in the government. And the idea of no Christianity in public schools would have been anathema to the Founding Fathers. They would have sent those guys off on a ship to some other country. Okay, next question. How do we see stars that are billions of light years away? I get this question every seminar I do, I believe. There's no question there's an awful lot of stars out there. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 9, Thou, even Thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made the heaven and the heaven of heavens. God created all the stars, and there's an awful lot of stars out there. It's interesting, stars blow up every once in a while. They run out of fuel or whatever happens, and they implode and then explode. It's called a nova, or if it's a big one, it's called a supernova. It seems that about every 30 years, a star explodes. Well, after searching the heavens, they've only found 300 supernova rings. So the question would be, if the universe is millions of years old, why aren't there more supernova rings, the remnants of these blown up stars? That indicates only a few thousand years. Of course, the Bible says God made everything 6,000 years ago, and the textbooks say it's billions of years old. I think the textbooks have a problem because there should be a lot more supernova rings. Plus, obviously, you have a problem. Stars being born should equal stars dying or else you're going to have a real serious problem. There are plenty of stars out there, but we've never seen one star forming. We see stars blow up every 25 or 30 years. We've never proven the formation of one new star. One atheist I debated said, oh, Hovind, there's this new star forming right now in Crab Nebula and some of the different uh, clouds out there in space. You see stars forming. No, you don't. You see spots getting brighter. You are assuming a star is forming, but actually all you're seeing is a spot getting brighter. It could be there's a dust cloud clearing and there was already a star behind it. Any fourth grader would know that. So nobody's ever proven the formation of one star. Uh, in Science Magazine in 86, they said the silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is that we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. The situation is no better now. There, nobody can prove any star formed by natural processes. If dust tries to get together, as it increases in density, it increases the temperature, which increases the m movement, and it drives it back away. It's called Boyle's gas laws. You cannot compress dust into um, solid matter without creating a real serious physical science problem of overcoming the gas laws. The pressure increases, the temperature increases, which drives them out again. It's not going to happen. One professor said, oh, Hovind, we figured if 20 stars explode near each other, they'll produce enough energy to squeeze the gas and make a new star. I said, well, sir, that's just brilliant. You know, you're saying if you lose 20, you can gain one. Man, you ought to run for Congress and help those guys borrow their way out of debt. You know, <laughs> that's a dumb idea. 
We've never seen it happen. It's purely theoretical that 20 stars could do that, but that is a losing proposition, not gaining. There are lots of stars. The Bible says God created the stars in Genesis 1:16. He created them to be lights on the earth. Psalm 147 says He counts the number of the stars and gives names to all of them. The Bible says He layeth the beam of his ch beams of His chambers in the waters. Who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. It is possible that Psalm 104 ties in with Psalm 148, that there is still water above the heavens. Nobody knows what's beyond out, you know, the stars, if there's an end at all. But it could be that this verse and uh, verse Revelation, where the Lord sits on many waters, is talking about the fact that there, is a, there was a layer of water above the earth, and there may be another layer of water beyond the stars. Don't know, just a theory, something to chew on. There's no way we can tell anyway. Okay. There's a lot of stars out there. It's been estimated that everybody on earth could own two, two trillion stars to yourself. That's a lot. Million, billion, trillion. The stars are really far away. Hubble telescope focused in on a dot. They thought they found a black spot in space about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. They looked at that spot for 10 days, and in that one spot there were so many stars they'd never seen before that they couldn't even count them. That's just one spot the size of a grain of sand, new stars just discovered. There's a lot of stars. Stephen Hawking, who, hate, who hates Christians and creationists, said, and won't debate me, by the way, Steve, I'll take you out any time. Uh, he said, stars are so far away, they appear to us to be just pinpoints of light. He said, there's only one feature we can observe, that is the color of their light. So when you look at a star, you cannot see the size or shape of the star. All you see is what color it is. We assume that stars are like the sun, and the sun is like stars, but that is purely an assumption. We don't know that. Some people say, oh yeah, we can tell by the elements that it's burning. It seems, gives a color characteristic, you know, the signature, you can tell the elements. You know, evolutionists never talk about this, but they are, of course, assuming that even the molecules evolved in other places, just like they evolved on Earth. They're assuming the same 92 elements we have here would be the same found throughout the universe. They've never talked about that, but you have a real serious problem if you just assume that the same molecular arrangement evolved, because molecules would have to evolve too, by your theory, which I think is a dumb idea. Okay. I taught high school trig for many years, is one of the uh, subjects I taught. If you want to find the distance to an object you can't possibly touch, like a star, you have to measure it with what's called parallax trigonometry. You have to know two sides and one angle, or two angles and one side, in order to calculate the distance to this unknown point, or to this, this unknown distance to this point, with simple sine, cosine, tangent. The problem is, Earth is only 8,000 miles in diameter, which is basically nothing compared to star distance. So to, to find the distance to a star, you have to get your observers further apart to make a triangle. That's, you know, a decent angle. Well, they look at the star in January, then they look at the star in June, and they get a much bigger base on their triangle. This is Earth's orbit around the Sun. Well, it's 93 million miles to the Sun, which is a long ways, but it takes light eight minutes to get here from the Sun. It's called one astronomical unit. That is, uh, the distance from the Sun to the Earth is an AU, an astronomical unit. So we are eight light minutes from the sun, which means the diameter of our orbit is 16 light minutes. That would be the diameter of Earth's orbit around the sun. This diagram here shows a little yellow dot on the far left. That would represent Earth's orbit, 16 light minutes. A year has 525,000 minutes in it. That's a real skinny triangle if you did it to scale. It's like having two surveyors with you know, a telescope 16 inches apart looking at a dot 525,000 inches away, which is eight and a third miles. You set that up and draw it out on a piece of graph paper, you find you got a real skinny triangle. It works out to be an angle of 0 0.017 degrees at the apex. I think you can have a hard time measuring something like that. If you want to measure 100 light years, by the way, that was just to measure one light year. If you wanted to measure 100 light years, You'd have to move your dot 830 miles away, keeping your surveyors 16 inches apart. That's like having two guys on my roof here in Pensacola, Florida, looking at a dot in Chicago. If the guys are 16 inches apart and they're focusing on a dot in Chicago, that's a real skinny triangle, okay? Figuring 15 billion light years is clearly impossible. It just can't be done. And I don't think you can tell exactly where you were six months ago on opposite sides of Earth's orbit. That would be a stretch also. Okay, this textbook says, parallax trigonometry can be used to measure distances less than 100 light years. I agree, much less. I think you'd have a hard time measuring 20 light years, but I'll give them 100, I'll give them 500 for the sake of the argument. The fact is you can't measure a billion. 
I'm not saying the stars aren't that far away. They, they probably are. I'm just pointing out we have no way of measuring it. We don't know how far away they are. If somebody tells you that star is, you know, 7.9 billion light years away, just say, how did you measure it? Was it a Stanley, a Lefkin, or a Craftsman? And who held the other end of that tape measure? Because I want to meet this guy. It just can't be done. So number one, we cannot measure the distance to the stars. Number two, we don't know what light is. Is it a wave? Is it a photon? Is it a particle? Is, I mean, it behaves sometimes like waves, sometimes like energy. It, it, nobody knows for sure what light is. We know what it does, and we use it all the time, obviously. But nobody's ever defined what light is very clearly. So the entire principle or concept behind a black hole is the idea that light can be attracted by gravity. Well, if light can be attracted by gravity, if black holes exist, which nobody's proven that either, but then the speed of light can't be a constant. At Harvard University in 99, they slowed light down to 38 miles an hour. The next year, they slowed it down to one mile an hour in the year 2000. The next year, they brought it to a dead stop. They took light and absolutely stopped it. This was done at Harvard, it was done at Smithsonian, and it was done at Cambridge. And by the way, that's how science works. An experiment should be demonstrable, repeatable, testable. Evolution is none of those. Nobody's ever demonstrated or tested or proven any of it. It's all in the mind. They think it happened. It's not science. Okay. At Princeton University in the year 2000, they speeded light up to 300 times the speed of light. Why would the speed of light be an unbreakable barrier? Uh, Barry Setterfield, Australian astronomer, did a lot of work on the speed of light question. He says, the speed of light has decreased. He said, in the last 300 years, at least 164 measurements of the speed of light have been published, 16 different ways it was measured. He said, the speed of light has apparently decreased so rapidly that experimental error cannot explain it. Here's a chart showing that the speed of light has declined in the last 150 years. About 1960, the chart seems to level off, and everybody since about 1960 has gotten the same number. If you measure the speed of light today, you're probably going to get 186,282 point something miles per second. Okay. That could be because in the late 50s and early 60s, they began using the atomic clock to measure the speed of light. And the atomic clock uses the wavelength of a cesium-133 atom, which means you're using light to measure light. You have a rubber ruler. Of course, you're not going to see it if it's declining. It may be we're on the tail end of a logarithmic, or logarithmic digression, or it simply may be we're using a rubber ruler by using this atomic clock to measure it. Here's a couple articles showing about how that the speed of light was apparently exceeded by a factor of as much as 100. Clear back in 88 and 95, there were articles published about this. The speed of light is not a constant. Um, the Radio Physical Research Institute in Russia, uh, the cosmologist there, said the speed of light was 10 billion times faster at time zero. Astrophysics and Space Science Magazine, 1987. According to the Big Bang Theory, the speed of light had to be much faster initially. Here's an article from 2001, uh, Science News, saying about the speed of light may have changed over history, study says. Um, Imperial College in London, the man wrote an article and said, a shocking possibility is that the speed of light might change in time during the life of the universe. At uh, Rutgers uh, News Service put on an article from Sydney about a team from Australia that said the speed of light may not be a constant in August of 2002. It says the speed of light can change. The speed limit of the cosmos is being questioned. September 2002. So there's a book out called Faster Than the Speed of Light. And I'm sure this fellow who wrote this book would be persecuted for daring to suggest such heresy as this. Discover Magazine uh, ran an article about this. Was Einstein wrong about the speed of light? A recent article saying Einstein was wrong. The speed of light is not a constant. So I don't think we can prove what light is, and I don't think we can prove lights always travel the same speed. Number three, the creation was finished when God made it. It's interesting, Jesus made wine out of grapes that never existed. Turned water straight to wine. Where's the grape stage? He can make a full-grown man out of the dirt and then make a woman out of his rib and make animals out of the dirt. He can make the earth out of nothing. Jesus made enough to feed 5,000 people out of a little boy sack lunch. We're always trying to limit God. I get real worried about folks that try to put human limitations on God. Uh, God didn't make two babies and put them in the Garden of Eden and hand them a package of seeds and say, here, plant these quick. You're going to need supper. He made a full-grown man and a full-grown woman in a full-grown garden. That's the only way it's going to work. Number four, thing to consider. A light year is a distance. It's not a time. It's a distance. It's the distance light can travel in a year at today's speed. A light year could be done in one second if you speeded the light up. 
It's simply a distance. It's like so many gazillion miles. I think a six trillion miles is a light year. Okay, number five. Since the speed of light is not proven to be consistent, why would star distance have anything to do with age of the universe? Some people say, oh, wait a minute now. I know we can't measure the distance with uh, tri triangulation, parallax trigonometry. What about measuring with Cepheid variables or redshift? Well, that's the other way they try to do it, and also loaded with flaws in the theory there. The redshift is the idea that when light goes uh, from a star, the red is shifted over. They look at the light through a spectroscope, and you'll see black lines on there, and the black lines are shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. You get the normal spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, but the black lines are shifted red. And they'll say, wow, this is proof the star is receding. It's running, it's moving away from us. That could be, I don't know. But there might be other ways to answer this. This is called the Doppler effect. If a train is coming toward you, it squeezes the sound waves in as the train makes noise, and you'll hear it. It drops pitch as it goes past you. It's called the Doppler effect. If you're going past the sound source or the sound source is going past you, either way, it works the same. Sound is it's called compressed coming in and refracted or stretched going out. Well, they thought possibly if the star is coming in, it would squeeze the light waves, whatever light waves are, and make a blue shift. If the star is leaving, it would make a red shift. And so when the red shift was discovered years ago, they looked around the heavens and found most of the stars are giving a red shift. And they said, wow, this proves they're leaving. No, it doesn't, but that was the assumption. And then they said, if all the stars are moving away, that proves there was a Big Bang. That was the evidence for the Big Bang Theory, <laughs> the red shift. Talk about a lack of logic, but uh, that's what they said. Okay. This fellow says there was an early sign that red shifts reliably indicate the distance of galaxies. For quasars, however, the diagram shows a wide scatter in apparent brightness at every red shift. He said, in fact, there is little correlation of brightness to red shift at all. Either quasars come in an extremely wide range of intrinsic luminosities, as most people believe, or the red shifts do not indicate distance. Sky and Telescope, December 94. Um, same magazine said, uh, thus for the only conclusion that can be drawn is that at least some quasars are relatively nearby and a large fraction of their redshift is due to something other than expansion of the universe. So if somebody tells you we know the distance to stars because of redshift, say, I'm sorry, that is simply not correct. We don't know the distance because of redshift. Get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, from our ministry. It's $5 for a 900-page book. Excellent book, loaded with stuff on creation evolution. He's got a whole section about the Doppler effect and the expanding universe. The Science News 95 said, another set of observations indicates that the universe appears to be 8.4 to 10.6 billion years old. The new work relied on the Hubble Space Telescope to obtain distance to faraway galaxies. A team led by Tanver at the University of England used a two-step method to estimate the Hubble constant. I always get a kick out of that. Here they've got an equation which involves a number that you're going to multiply, like an algebraic equation, and they can change that number. They call it a constant, but they change it all the time. Okay. I taught algebra for years. I'm telling you, you change one letter in an equation or one value in an equation, you change the outcome. That's why they're always getting wild numbers for the age of the universe, because the Hubble constant is not a constant at all. Okay, let's go on here. He said, first they observed a type of standard candle, stars known as Cepheid variables, to find the distance to the spiral galaxy M96. He said, you have to be very careful about drawing conclusions because of the Hubble constant, because measurements have huge systematic errors. Astronomers believed the veil, one of the best studied supernova remnants, was 2,500 years, light years away and 18,000 years old. They were quite wrong. In fact, the veil is only 1,500 light years away and 5,000 years old, from Discover Magazine, January of 2001. An article about Rip Van Winkle showing stars are much younger than they thought. Um, the article, University Around Us at Cambridge University, said even the nearest Cephids are so remote, it's difficult to determine their absolute distance with any accuracy, any great accuracy. All large distances in astronomical literature are subject to an error of perhaps 10% from this cause alone. He said, we know that faintness, you know, how bright the star is, arises from two causes, distance and absorbing matter in space, and it's generally not possible to apportion it between the two. Get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, and find out what happened to Halt and Harp, who dared to question the redshift theory. Good way to lose your job. There's discrimination against those because they're looking for, uh, looking for anything to hang on to this dumb Big Bang Theory is the problem. Big Bang Theory is a dud. Fred Hoyle said that 30 years ago, or 20 years ago. Okay, Isaiah 40 tells us the Lord sits on the circle of the earth, and it says he stretched out the heavens like a curtain. 
Isaiah 42 talks about the stretching of the heavens. Isaiah 45 says he stretched out the heavens. Jeremiah 10 says he stretched out the heavens. There are several theories of what's causing the red shift. One theory is the stretching from the creation. This is a normal thing you would expect because he stretched out the heavens like a curtain, just like the Bible told us. Maybe that's the only reason we have a red shift. Second theory is the light's getting tired, traveling great distance. Third theory is as it travels through whatever space is made up, maybe space is nothing, maybe space is something, we don't know what space is, but as the light travels, that may automatically be a phenomena that causes the red shift. It could be the Doppler effect, the star could be moving away, I don't know, and nobody knows, okay? It could be the light is being speeded up or slowed down as it goes past a dense gravitational mass in space. We simply don't know what's causing the red shift. Next question, I get asked this question quite frequently actually, is the sun shrinking? The sun is obviously burning, you can step outside and look at it in the daytime. The sun is losing about 5 million tons of mass every second. The sun is obviously burning and losing an enormous amount of fuel. So if you go backwards in time and add 5 million tons per second to the sun, you start to create a problem at some point. I don't know what the number is, and I wouldn't give a number because as soon as I give a number and say X number of million years ago this would have happened, the atheist or the skeptic will pick on the number and miss the concept. The fact is the sun is burning. If the sun were larger, it would begin to suck Mercury and Venus in, first of all, Mercury first and then Venus, and then slowly affect Earth. Uh, the Bulletin of American Astronomical Society in uh, 1979 said, since 1836, more than 100 direct observers, different observers at the Royal Greenwich Observatory and the U.S. Naval Observatory have made direct visual measurements that suggest the sun's diameter is shrinking at the rate of about a tenth of a percent each century which works out to be five feet per hour. Now, whether the number's right, I don't know, but the fact is it's pretty obvious the sun is burning, and the sun, for 100 years of measurements, they said it's shrinking about five feet an hour. Of course, now the sun is gigantic, about 880,000 miles in diameter, so it's not a problem. We're not going to lose it anytime soon. Uh, Science Magazine ran an article in 1980 that said several d indirect techniques also confirm the sun is shrinking, although these inferred collapse are only about one-seventh as much. By that thinking, the sun would have been touching the earth uh, 158 million years ago. And again, I don't, that's not my number. Somebody else uh, came up with that as a possible calculation that the sun would have been touching the earth. The fact is the sun is shrinking. This chart shows the measurements of the, not only the polar diameter, but the equatorial diameter. The sun has uh, north and south pole like the earth does. Both measurements are diminishing in the last 160 years. It's been observed, the sun is shrinking. Now the sun oscillates, it swells and shrinks and swells and shrinks, but the overall trend is quite obviously toward shrinking. The sun is burning. That creates a problem. If you go backwards in time, the sun would be bigger and more massive, which is going to upset the gravitational pull. So I don't think it's logical to say the Earth's been going around the sun for billions of years while the sun is constantly losing this mass and losing its gravitational pull. To me, that invokes the miracle. It's much simpler to say the system is not billions of years old like they're telling us. God created everything about 6,000 years ago exactly like the Bible says. Okay, what about carbon dating? Every seminar I do, somebody will say, wait a minute, carbon dating proves the Earth is millions of years old. Oh, no, it doesn't. The fossils are actually dated by their position in the geologic column. We cover that in seminar part four. And the geologic column does not exist any place in the world. Radiometric dating would not even be possible if the geologic column had not been erected first. Article in journal, uh, American Journal of Science Magazine talked about this. Ever since William Smith at the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. Apart from very modern examples, which really are archaeology, this guy said, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. So they don't date fossils by carbon dating or potassium argon dating. This is a mammoth tooth. They date them by the geologic column. They pick a spot and say, wow, that era was, you know, so many thousand years ago, and so this must be that old. Fossils are not dated by carbon dating. But let me explain how carbon dating works. The Earth's atmosphere is about 100 miles thick. On this globe, it doesn't even show up. I mean, it's the thickness of the, of the paint, basically. 100 miles is not much. The space shuttle whizzes around just above the atmosphere so it cuts down on drag and they can get no friction up there. Uh, still get lousy gas mileage though. The um, air, 100 miles thick, is mostly nitrogen. 78% uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.06% carbon dioxide, and that's what plants breathe, CO2. Some people say 0.09 or 0.03, I don't know, it varies I'm sure. 
location to location, but there's not a lot of CO2 in the air. If you increase CO2, plants grow faster, which is a frustration for the environmentalist wackos when they burn forests, you know, all the CO2 is released and the trees next door grow faster. So it doesn't uh, create an environmental crisis like they want you to believe. Uh, there's extremely small quantities of radioactive carbon-14. The way this works, uh, radiation from the sun strikes the atmosphere, super high speed energy comes down, bangs into the nitrogen, and changes it to carbon-14. Just a quick simple chemistry lesson here. Carbon and nitrogen are right next to each other on the periodic table. Nitrogen is number 14, carbon is number 12. But if the nitrogen gets blasted by radiation, it turns into carbon-14. Normal carbon is called carbon-12. Here we have some what's called radioactive carbon, carbon-14. It's very rare, um, and it doesn't stay stable because it's always breaking apart. You can hear it with a Geiger counter. You know, in the movies, they got the Geiger counter getting by the uranium and going click, 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 click. Well, the same thing with carbon-14. It breaks apart. It's falling apart. And it's turning back into nitrogen and disappearing, which is a gas. It disappears into the air. Um, Carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere by the sun. It breaks down at the rate of about half of it will break down every 5,730 years. This is called the half-life. So if I gave you a pile of carbon-14 and you waited 5,730 years, half of it would turn back to nitrogen and you'd end up with half a pile. If you wait another 5,700 years, half of that is going to turn to nitrogen. You end up with a fourth of a pile. In theory, it never goes to zero. It goes from half to fourth to eighth to sixteenth, etc. Plants are always breathing in carbon-14 in the photosynthesis process. They're breathing in carbon. Some of it's carbon-14. Most of it's normal carbon-12. Animals eat the plants and make it part of their body. Probably during your lifetime, you've either eaten plants or you've eaten animals that have eaten plants. That's about all there is to eat out there. And so you're absorbing radioactive carbon into you, just like I am into me, because we're getting it through the food chain. The plants got it from the air. The air got it from the sun. This carbon-14 got into the plants. Then it got into you or into the animals and then into you. But either way, we all contain some radioactive carbon. When the plant or animal dies, it's not going to get any more, obviously. So several assumptions are involved in carbon dating. First of all, they assume that the amount of C14 in the atmosphere, the ratio, which is a very small number, is the same found in the plants and animals. For instance, the atmosphere contains 0.0000765% radioactive carbon-14. It is assumed that I have the same. I've never been tested for C14, and I've never met anybody who has. But I would say that's a reasonable assumption, but it is an assumption. Okay. When the plant or animal dies, it doesn't get any more C14, so whatever it had begins to decay. It was decaying while it was alive, but you never noticed it because it's being replenished, so the balance would stay. But as soon as it dies, it begins to go out of balance. So basically, carbon dating is measuring the amount of carbon in the object with the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and getting a balance. If the atmosphere is 0.0000765% and the object you're dating is only half as much, they would assume it's been dead for one half-life. If it's only one-fourth as much, it's been dead for two half-lives, two times 5,730. And then it goes to a fourth, to an eighth, to a sixteenth. So they're comparing the amount in the object with the amount in the atmosphere. This is how carbon dating works. Sounds good, certainly sounds scientific. But it's based on some serious assumptions that mess up everything. It doesn't work. If I told you to fill a barrel with water, but I have drilled holes in the barrel, while you're putting water in, it begins to leak out. So you have a process of filling and a process of leaking at the same time. You have adding and subtracting going on simultaneously. At some point, you're going to reach a stage called equilibrium. You'll never fill the barrel past that point unless you speed up the input or decrease the outgo one or the other. Well, Earth's atmosphere is constantly taking in carbon-14 from the sun and it's constantly losing it to decay. So you have the same thing as the barrel. The question would be, how long would it take the Earth's atmosphere to reach equilibrium? Well, when carbon dating was first discovered or invented in the early 1950s or late 1940s actually, Willard Libby did this, University of Chicago, he said, you know, I wonder how long it would take the Earth's atmosphere to reach equilibrium, because he knew about the equilibrium problem. They said, after some, doing some studies, it would take about 30,000 years. Basically, if you made a brand new planet Earth, poof, create one, cover it with air, start it spinning around itself and spinning around the sun, the sun is going to strike the oxygen, strike the atmosphere and produce carbon-14, and it's going to start decaying. And they said, within 30,000 years, the atmosphere would be equalized. You'd reach this point called equilibrium. 
You're never going to get more C14, and you shouldn't get any less unless something changes in the system. Well, sounds good. I don't know if the number's right, but it's a, the concept is. Within 30,000 years, the Earth's atmosphere would reach equilibrium. The problem is, we still haven't reached equilibrium. There's more C14 now than there was 20 years ago. Actually, radiocarbon is forming 28 to 37 percent faster than it's decaying. So if we still haven't reached equilibrium, then the Earth is less than 30,000 years old, which is what the Christians have been saying all along. Uh, a friend of mine has a website, archie.org. You can get information there about uh, the Earth's atmosphere has still not reached equilibrium. There's been a lot of people doing research on this, and it just we're, we're not there yet. This chart indicates how carbon-14 is supposed to work in theory. An, an object that is still alive should be in balance with the atmosphere, which would give you 16, I'm going to simplify this a little bit, give you 16 clicks per minute per gram on your Geiger counter. If you're listening to, a, you know, dating a, testing a sample, it'll go click every four seconds, you know, click. Click. If it's only giving you eight clicks per minute, then you're getting, you're assuming it's 5,700 years old. It's been through one half life. If you're only getting four clicks per minute, it's been through two half lives. If you're getting two clicks per minute, it's been through three half lives. It's 11,000 years old. This is how carbon dating is done. If you test a sample and you find out you're getting, you know, two and a half clicks per minute or 2.9 or something like that, you look at the chart and read over and find the age by the simple calibration curve, they call it. Sounds good. Doesn't work. If you walked into a room and found a candle burning on a table, and I asked you the very simple question, when was it lit? You say, oh, I don't know, it was burning when I got here. Okay, let's do what's called empirical science, things we can test and demonstrate and weigh and prove, okay? We're going to measure the candle. If we measure the height of the candle, we find out the candle is seven inches tall. Okay, when was it lit? You say, oh, I don't know. Okay, let's do some more science. Let's measure how fast it burns. Suppose we get an Olympic stopwatch and we measure this thing very carefully and find out the candle is burning one inch every hour. Now we've got two hard science empirical facts. The candle is seven inches tall. It is burning an inch an hour. When was it lit? You still can't tell me unless you make some assumptions. How tall was it? And has it always burned at the same rate? Neither of those assumptions can be proven. They are purely assumptions, okay? If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You don't even know where it died. You just know where it ended up buried, that's all. Now, the amount of carbon-14 could be measured very precisely, and the rate of, de of decay could be determined. But when did it live? I have no idea, and nobody does, because you'd have to know how much was in it when it was alive, which that would depend on the assumption that the Earth's atmosphere has reached equilibrium, and we haven't. And you'd have to know that it's always decayed at the same rate. Now, if the Bible is right and the earth had a canopy of water overhead, like the Bible, I think, clearly teaches in 2 Peter 3 and in Genesis 1, 6, and 7, this canopy of water would filter out quite a bit of radiation. And they probably had a lot less carbon-14 in the original creation than we do today. So if you dig up a fossil from an animal that drowned in the flood, and I don't know if any of these are or not, but if you find a fossil and say, well, I believe this one, uh, this ammonite may have drowned in the flood probably did. And we want to find and find out it's got carbon. It probably doesn't. It's been totally replaced by minerals, but let's assume it it's, 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 has an organic material. And so we carbon date it. They would assume that it lived in an atmosphere that just like we have today. Meh, faulty assumption. Not a good idea. There's some examples of how carbon dating doesn't work. We'll go in chronological order here. Back in 1949, an article came out in Natural History magazine it said the lower leg of a mammoth dated 15,000 years old, but the skin dated 21,000 years old. It didn't work in 1949. 1963, a living mollusk shell, carbon dated at 2,300 years old. Well, here we are 14 years later, carbon dating is still not working. Okay? Um, 1970, this article came out and they said, if a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it is not entirely contradicting, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. 1971, a freshly killed seal carbon dated at 1,300 years old. Still not working, folks. Okay. 1975, a baby mammoth was found frozen. Part of it dated 40,000 years old. Another part was 26,000 years old, and the wood next to it is 9,000 years old. Still not working in 1975. 1981, 
They tried it again. This guy said, no matter how useful it is, the radiocarbon method is still not capable of yielding accurate and reliable results. There are gross discrepancies, the chronology is uneven and relative, and the accepted dates are actually selected dates. This whole blessed thing is nothing but 13th century alchemy. It all depends upon which funny paper you read. Still not working. 1984. Shells from living snails were carbon dated at 27,000 years old. Still not working. 1985. They took 11 human skeletons, the earliest known human remains in the Western Hemisphere, and they were carbon dated or dated by accelerator mass spectrometer, all 11 dated 5,000 radiocarbon years or less. Here, these things are supposed to be, you know, a quarter million years old or something. It's not working in 1985. 1992, two Colorado Creek mammoths, side by side, buried frozen mammoths, were dated. One was 22,000 years old, the other is 16,000 years old. Still not working in 92. In 1996, at uh, Berkeley University, they've got the Geochronology Center. Carl Swisher used the most advanced techniques to date human fossils. This article said last spring he was reevaluating Homo erectus skulls found in Java by testing the sediment found with them. A hominid species assumed to be an ancestor of Homo sapien, erectus was thought to have vanished a quarter million years ago. Even though he used two different dating methods, Swisher kept making the same startling find. The bones were 53,000 at most and possibly no more than 27,000. Well, I would like to point out, Your Honor, that is a 96% error. So it's not working in 1996 either. Um, it's not logical to say carbon dating works. One part of a mammoth dated 29,000 years old, another part was 44,000 years old. This article said, in the last two years, an absolute date has been obtained for the Gandong beds. It has the very interesting value of 300,000 years, plus or minus 300,000 years. So it doesn't work. We have in our library the Geological Survey Professional paper, 862. Some skeptics on the web have argued that you know, I didn't understand what the paper was saying. I think I do. It shows the charts here of the different carbon dates they got from different animals and different you know, organic material found all over Alaska, the Geological Survey paper. Sample number 454, carbon dated at 17,210 years old. Sample 455 gave a carbon date of 24,000 years old. People say, see, what's the big deal? Well, look at it. This is the same sample as 454. 455 and 454 are the same creature. They're getting different ages. Sample 299 was dated at less than 20,000 years old. Sample 137X was dated at greater than 28,000. But read it carefully. That's the same sample as 299. They gave it a different number at a different laboratory, but it's the same sample. Two different numbers, same sample. Living penguins date 8,000 years old. Dinosaur, material from dinosaur bone layers were found and dated at 34,000 years old. They find organic material with dinosaurs, sometimes frozen dinosaur bones, sometimes unfossilized dinosaur bones are found. Um, two Russian scientists dated dinosaur bones at less than 30,000 years old. Hugh Miller in Columbus, Ohio had four dinosaur bone samples carbon dated. They told him they were 20,000 years old. He didn't tell them they were dinosaur bones. If he would have said, this is a dinosaur bone and I want you to carbon date it, they would have said, oh, we can't date that because it's too old. See, they start with, this is a dinosaur bone, by the way, it's been replaced by minerals. But they start with the assumption that dinosaurs lived 70 million years ago. If I took this to a laboratory and said, would you please date this, they would say, oh, well, we'd have to use something other than carbon dating because this is too old for carbon dating. They've already decided what range it fits in. That's not how science ought to work. You ought to be able to say, well, uh, let's just be open-minded about this. They can date the same sample 10 ways and get 10 different numbers. Okay? Here's the things to consider about carbon dating. If you date a sample of known age, I mean, you know how old it is, like the, uh, a tree ring. Carbon dating doesn't work. If you date a sample of unknown age, it's assumed to work. It's not science, that's not common sense. As elements decay, they produce helium. One of the byproducts of carbon decay or radioactive decay of any kind is it produces helium gas, which, you know, if, unless you're in the ground where it can be trapped in a cave, it's going to escape into the atmosphere. The helium in the atmosphere indicates the Earth is not billions of years old, actually less than two million years old, just based on the helium content in the atmosphere. If radioactive decay has been going on for millions of years, there should be a lot more helium. Taking all factors into account, the helium escape mechanisms and everything, it just 
it, it's not more than 2 million years old. It's an excellent book if you want to get more in the go down deep stuff on carbon dating. You can get it through our bookstore if you want or call icr.org. They have the book there. This guy said the rocks date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. But I'll tell you what, folks, the cheese done fell out of his sandwich. All right? He said they use circu it's circularity is inherent in the derivation of time scales. They use circular reasoning. Uh, specimen uh, 10017 from the moon was dated six, divided into six pieces and dated many times. The ages range from 2.5 to 4.6 billion. Notice that's nearly a 500% error. It doesn't work. I talked to a J.P. Dawson in Oklahoma. He was the chief of engineering and operations for the Lunar and Earth Science Division at uh, NASA in Houston. He said they worked on the lunar samples, including the Genesis rock. He told me they found ages from 10,000 years to several billion years in the same rock. So basically, you can kind of pick what you want. There's an excellent chapter in this book uh, called Bones of Contention. The last chapter deals with what's called the dating game. It's hilarious to see how they change the dates uh, to make them fit. You know, if any new evidence comes in, we'll just change the date and make it fit the theory. All right, we'll take a little break here, come back and talk about the other dating methods, potassium argon, some of the other ones, and then go on to more of your questions. Okay, let's take a few more questions and answers. People often ask me about the age of the Earth and say, doesn't potassium argon dating prove the Earth is millions or billions of years old? Well, potassium is one of the elements in the periodic table. It slowly decays and turns to argon, which is a gas. So the theory is that when a volcano erupts, it melts the rock and turns to lava and comes out and spreads down the hillside, and the gas would escape because it is now a liquid. And so as potassium slowly decays to argon, which is a gas, if it melts the rock, it should reset the clock to zero. And so they think we can tell how old lava flows are, or ash flows, ash beds, because there should be no argon in them. It should reset the clock. It should be just potassium. Well, it sounds good in theory, but in practice, when you actually test it, it doesn't work, OK? It's true that potassium decays to argon. It has a half-life of about uh, 1.3 billion years. It very, very slowly decays. Of course, nobody watched it for 1.3 billion years. They watched it for three or four days in the laboratory and estimated how long it would take for half of it to disappear. But let's assume the half-life is right, and that would be quite an assumption, but I, I don't argue that much with them. The fact is, when you actually test it, like the lava flows that were tested from New Zealand, now this chart shows from the a radioactive dating failure here article, about potassium argon uh, dates were given for a 1975 eruption at the very bottom of the list here, February 19th, and yet it was... Uh, way off. It was one to two, or a quarter of a million years old, and yet it was only 1975. 1949, a lava flow, they knew it erupted in 1949, yet it gave, gave an age of uh, a, a little less than a quarter million years old. So it just simply doesn't work. Um, as much as 80% of the potassium in a small sample in an iron meteorite can be removed in distilled water in four and a half hours. So we don't know that it actually resets the clock. This Canadian Journal of uh, Earth Science article said, in conventional dating for potassium argon, it's common to discard ages which are substantially too high or too low compared with the rest of the group or with other available data such as the geologic time scale. Oh, now here the truth comes out. Things are really dated by the geologic chart, not by just you know potassium argon dating. We've been through that before. In uh, Nature magazine back in April of 1970, they had gave another example where they had dated a, a layer of ash called the KBS Tuff, named after K. Brenzenmeyer. This layer of ash was dated at between 212 and 230 million years old. I mean, for years, everybody had dated this layer of ash, and everybody agreed it's 200, you know, over 200 million years old. What they'll do is, if you look at the picture here, they will have different layers of ash that they will f assign dates to. These are from volcanic eruptions, lava flows, or ash layers. If you find a fossil between two layers, you can guess how old it was based upon the potassium argon date of the one above and the date of the one below. Sounds good. Doesn't work. Uh, they bracket the sample by the, uh, what's called an event horizon is the term they use for it. They'll say, well, there's a volcanic eruption and made this layer of ash over the whole countryside. Any fossils found below that layer have to be older. Any fossils found above this layer have to be younger. Sounds good. And uh, until Richard Leakey found a skull called the uh, KNMER for uh, 
uh, they give all these give them numbers. KNMER 1470. The skull was found under the KBS tuff. Now here, everybody had been saying the KBS tuff was over 200 million years old, and they find a normal human skull under it. Ooh, now you got a problem. So they redated this, the ash layers, the KBS tuff. They would, they would never have done, redated it if it hadn't found that skull. They redated the ash layers and took 10 samples and got numbers from 0.5 million to 2.64 million. Well, first I'd like to point out that's way down from 212, and still that's a 500% error. It doesn't work. I mean, a 500% error, they'd laugh at you if you put this in a court of law. It's interesting to look at the, the inflation of the age of the Earth. Back in 1770, George Buffon said the Earth is 70,000 years old. In 1905, the textbooks would say the Earth is 2 billion years old. In 1969, when they went to the Moon, they said the Moon and the Earth are 3.5 billion years old, and this number was arrived at by potassium-argon dating, like this article says here. Today, the students are taught it's 4.6 billion years old. It's interesting. Do you know the Earth is getting older at the rate of 21 million years per year? That's uh, 40 years per minute. We're aging rapidly, folks, so it just, it's silly. Here's the things to consider about potassium argon, or any dating method for that matter. Number one, wild dates are frequently obtained. They're not always consistent. They get all kinds of numbers. They pick the ones that they want based on the preconceived idea, which is based, based on the geologic column, which is dumb. Secondly, dates that don't fit the theory are routinely rejected. Uh, that's not how science ought to work. I mean, it ought, if it works, it ought to work every time, if it ought to be testable or demonstrable. Uh, number three, it's obvious any dating method is based on the assumptions that the original content can be known, that the decay rate never changes, that the sample has never been contaminated. And the fourth observation somebody needs to point out to these guys is all of these decay rates are based on a decline downhill slide, not uphill. Potassium decays to argon. Uh, Carbon-14 decays. Uh, everything is decaying. This is the opposite of evolution. They need something that's improving. This will go back to the concept we talk about on Seminar Part 4 of the six different meanings of the word evolution. You have to have chemical evolution, where the chemicals go higher on the periodic table, not lower. All of these are examples of them going lower. Mount St. Helens erupted. Many volcanoes erupt. For instance, Mount Etna erupted in Sicily back in uh, 122 BC. It was a dated eruption. They had historical evidence for it. When the potassium argon dated it, it was a quarter million years old. The 1801 Hawaiian lava flow gave a potassium argon age of 1.6 million. It didn't work. Another Hawaiian lava flow from 1959 gave an age of 8.5 million years old. Mount Etna from Sicily erupted again in 1964. It dated, and everybody watched it happen. And if they, when they dated it with potassium argon dating, it was 700,000 years old. In 1972, it erupted again, and now the dates came 350,000 years old. The lava from Mount St. Helens was tested right after it erupted in 1980. Brand new lava dome, they knew the age of it, and yet it gave numbers from different dating methods ranging from 350,000 to 2.8 million. This is coming from the same rocks from the lava flow that they knew is 20 years old. So, Again, when you date a sample of known age, it doesn't work. When you date a sample of unknown age, it is assumed to work. That's not common sense. And again, wild dates are picked. They find them all the time. They pick the numbers they want. They reject anything they don't like. It's based on many assumptions, just like any other dating method is. Okay, get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, if you want a whole lot more on the other dating methods about uranium-235, uranium-238. There's much information there or on the website icr.org, which is an uh, institute for creation research. Next question. Have fresh dinosaur bones been found? Absolutely yes, quite a few actually. Uh, some frozen dinosaur bones were found in the book here, The Great Alaskan Dinosaur Adventure from Master Books in Arkansas. You can read about going up and finding frozen dinosaur bones. In 1993, the Journal of Science, uh, December 24th, Christmas Eve, they reported an amazing preservation of the bones of a young duckbill dinosaur found in Montana. Under the microscope, the fine structure of the bones was seen to have been preserved to such an extent that the cell characteristics could be compared with cells of chicken bone. 1961, in northwest Alaska, they found a bed of dinosaur bones that were unpermineralized. That means not fossilized. That is from uh, Journal of Paleontology, uh, 1986-87. Um, in Omni Magazine, January of 90, 1990, they talk about on the banks of the river in uh, Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, frozen dinosaur bones were found that are as light as balsa wood and look as fresh as yesterday's dog bones. The structure was porous and the fossils were not mineralized. 
On Bylot Island, 1987, they found the lower jaw of a duck-billed dinosaur that was in fresh condition. Joe Taylor, who does a lot of digging for dinosaurs in Texas, in uh, Crosbyton, Texas, outside of Lubbock, has discovered many times, he said he finds dinosaur bones that are not fossilized. So the idea that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago is, is silly. Um, so, next question. If there really was a flood, where are all the human bones? People say, oh, if the world was totally destroyed, they ought to find millions of human fossils. Well, pr about 4,000 human remains have been found, according to Marvin Lubinow, who's one of the smartest guys I know on the topic of uh, uh, human ancestors. You know, his book, Bones of Contention, is excellent from a Christian perspective on uh, all the so-called cavemen that they're finding. Many of the f human remains, even those are very fragmentary, just one bone or just a few bones, but let's assume 4,000 human remains have been found, just to pick a number. I think when God made the earth uh, 6,000 years ago, it was full of plants, full of animals, and only two people. 4,400 years later, when the flood, or 1,600 years later, when the flood came, the world is still full of plants and still full of animals and still not full of people. I'm not sure what the population was. I would pick a number clear out of the clear blue sky and say, let's assume there was a billion people at the time of the flood. Could may have been a lot more. If they had 100 kids per family, populations grow quickly like that. But let's say, that, uh, let's say it was a population of a billion. Uh, it may have been 10 billion. I don't think there's any way to tell. Okay. Problem is, they all died except for Noah and his family. So, 1,600 years and 1,650 years after the creation, you still don't have the world full of people yet. The purpose of the flood was to destroy man off the earth, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 7. The Bible also says there were giants in the earth in those days, men of renown, mighty men, big people. Here's a, a picture we use on a seminar part uh, 2 about the human thumb bone on top compared with a giant human thumb bone underneath, found right near Mount Ararat. Here's the reasons I would give why so few human fossils have been found. Number one, there were less animals to be killed, less people to be killed than there were animals. Okay, so you're more likely to find animal bones than human bones, simply because there were, there were more of them. Okay, God only made two people, but he made a world full of animals. Secondly, people are smarter than animals. Yeah, well, some people anyway. And so they would tend to avoid drowning until last, and they end up on top. So they end up rotting instead of being buried. In order to fossilize, the animal has to be buried. So I think you're more likely to find animal fossils than human fossils for this reason also. Thirdly, if humans were bigger, the bones might not be recognized as human. Because many people go into this study with a preconceived idea that evolution is true and man used to be small and we're getting bigger and better and stronger and smarter, and probably exactly the opposite is true. If people were 8 or 9 or 10 feet tall before the flood, and you found, dinosaur, or you found human bones from somebody 8 or 9 or 10 feet tall, like this thigh bone here over my head, which is from a human that would have been nearly 13 feet tall. We cover that on uh, video number three about the, or video two, I guess, about the giant people. That would have been a 13-foot human. Well, if, if just a fragment of that bone was found, nobody would dream it came from a human if they believed in evolution because they've got stuck in their head, man used to be like a chimpanzee, you know, three feet tall, and now we're six feet tall. And so they would, they would assign it to something else. They would call it a cave bear or a giant sloth or something. Okay, it can't be human. That they would know for sure. So I think many bones are misidentified for that reason because of the preconceived evolutionary uh, concept, which is a great hindrance to scientific research. Next question. Where did Noah get pitch? In my uh, debate number seven uh, with an atheist that uh, was a former preacher, a Church of Christ preacher turned atheist, he said Noah couldn't make pitch because pitch is made from oil and oil formed during the flood. Well, there's a problem with that, <laughs> several problems with that. <laughs> Genesis chapter 6, God said to Noah uh, to make the ark with gopher wood and pitch it with pitch within and without. Obviously, he's going to pitch it uh, before the flood comes, so he's not going to make it out of oil that are made from creatures that drowned in the flood. Exodus 2 talks about uh, Pharaoh's daughter drawing Moses from a, uh, a basket that was daubed with pitch. They covered it with pitch. Well, what is pitch anyway? Isaiah 34 talks about pitch. It says burning pitch, and it puts off a smoke. Here we learn a few things about pitch. If you get a dictionary from 1828, Webster's Dictionary, 1828, you'll notice you can look up the word pitch. And by the way, 1828 is before oil was used commercially. I think the first oil well was drilled in Pennsylvania about 1830s or 40s, maybe. I don't know, remember the date. But certainly there were no oil wells that we know of before that. So they weren't drilling into the ground to get oil, and yet they were making pitch in 1828. It's in the dictionary. It says, pitch is a thick, tenacious substance, the juice of a species of pine or fir. It's made from pine trees. It's the juice, the sap of a tree. 
It's, uh, second definition says it's the resin of pine or turpentine. It's used in caulking ships and paying the sides and bottom. That's to waterproof the boats. So they were used, they were pitch industries, they were whole factories. They produced pitch, they put it in barrels and they would sell it to ship making companies who would cover their, it's basically like a tar substance but it's made from the sap of trees. So no, don't tell me the Bible's wrong because it says they used pitch before the flood. The Bible is absolutely correct and the skeptics are wrong. Okay, next question. Was ancient man primitive? Some people get this false idea that modern man is smart and everybody in the past was dumb. <laughs> That's <coughs> ridiculous. There's a lot of indication ancient man was extremely smart. There's an excellent book we sell called The Puzzle of Ancient Man by Don Chittick. Highly recommend this one. It's about 10 bucks. Showing some of the incredible achievements of ancient man. Before the flood came, the Bible says the people lived to be over 900 years old. You could learn a lot in 900 years. Plus, when you consider a couple other factors, they lived in a perfect environment. They would have had much higher IQs, much uh, less to do as far as just daily things you have to do just to live. Most of those things are taken care of in a Garden of Eden. Don't need a house. You got perfect weather. So they can devote all their time to uh, study or learning things. Plus, Adam came pre-programmed from the hand of God, probably had an incredibly high IQ, and he got to walk and talk with God for a while till he sinned, maybe a hundred years, we don't know, but uh, got to walk and talk with God. The other factor to consider is Adam lived long enough to know his great, 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 great grandson. Noah's daddy could have known Adam for 56 years. So you get not only a much greater starting, uh, a much higher starting point, they already knew a lot because God pre-programmed it into Adam, plus they lived a long time and could learn a lot more, plus they lived long enough to pass this on to many generations. Today, an awful lot of knowledge goes to the grave. You know, about the time you know it all, you're, you die. Uh, or you, by the time you know a bunch of stuff, you die. Imagine if guys like Einstein could live, you know, f eight or nine hundred years. How much could they, how much knowledge could they accumulate in a brain like that? So, I think before the flood, they were much smarter, much smarter than we are today. And some of this knowledge uh, was passed down, and as lifespans got shorter, it began to be lost. And a lot of societies were arranged to try to, uh, secret societies to preserve this knowledge, you know, th uh, through different cultures and things like that. But they opened up a grave in South America. The grave was probably made about a thousand years ago uh, uh, and found a, this little uh, gold artifact in there. You can see it next to the dime for scale. Little, uh, looks like an airplane about this big. The Smithsonian has it and they have it labeled as a stylized insect. Because they got this preconceived idea, ancient man was dumb, modern man is smart, they could not possibly have known about airplanes a thousand years ago. And yet, here they've got one. That's not a stylized insect. I'm sorry, they knew about flight. An Egyptian tomb was opened as 2100 years old, and it also had an airplane in it, a little model glider. How did they know about airplanes over 2000 years ago? This iron pot found in a lump of coal indicates a high level of technology before coal formed. I believe coal formed in the flood in the days of Noah, so an iron pot is not a problem. The Bible says Tubalcain was an artificer in brass and iron. Some of the walls that are found in Peru of these giant stone walls have these massive blocks of stone that are cut and they fit together perfectly. One of the stones in one of these walls weighs 20,000 tons. Well, the biggest crane on earth today <coughs> can only lift 3,000 tons. How on earth were they lifting a stone 20,000 tons? We simply don't know how they did it. Actually, in the book uh, Secret of the Lost Races, the author said, what's truly impossible about the block is that it's the size of a five-story house and weighs an estimated 20,000 tons. He said, we have no combination of machinery today that could dislodge such a weight, let alone move it any distance. It shows their mastery of a technology that we as yet have not attained. Somebody in the past knew something we can't even do today, and I think that's the case with a lot of things. This brass uh, bell type thing was found inside a lump of coal. Mr. Newton Anderson has it sitting on his desk. I've talked to him many times about it. I think you ought to donate it to our museum here, Mr. Anderson. We'd keep it safe for you, I'm sure. But if kids could come by and see it here, we'd love to have that. By the way, if you have any artifacts for our museum, we'd, we'd love to get anything. We want to influence people for the Lord. So if it's sitting in your closet gathering dust, you can put it on loan or give it to us or we'll buy it off you if we can afford it. So that's the kind of things we have here. We want to get the gospel out. This uh, vase found in solid rock, supposed to be 600,000 years old. Ancient man was 600 million years old. Ancient man was not primitive. They found a sunken ship in the Aegean Sea, which is near Greece in the Mediterranean. And there was uh, encrusted on there what appeared to be an analog computing device. 
the more they analyze this thing, it's now in the National Science Foundation uh, Museum, I believe, in, uh, I don't remember where that one's at, but I read about it a little bit. This uh, com looks like an analog computer. This is uh, 2,100 years ago. This hammer was found in uh, rock supposed to be 400 million years old by a lady in Texas. Battelle Laboratory said it's 96.6 percent iron, 2.6 percent chlorine, 0.74 percent sulfur. No carbon. And yet it is stainless steel. It won't, it won't, rot. It won't rust. Carl Baugh's got it in his museum down in Glen Rose, Texas. Apparently they knew about electricity a long time ago because this battery uh, was found in Iraq from about uh, 2,000 years ago. The Egyptians must have known about electricity. This hieroglyphic shows what appears to be wires and a generator or something hooked up to these uh, two snakes. Either the snakes are producing the electricity or they're putting the electricity into the snakes. I don't know, but they must have known about uh, electricity a long time ago. They certainly knew about tampering with the skull, about brain surgery. Some of the skulls are found with holes that actually healed up. They did brain surgery and the people lived. One of the Ica stones from Peru shows a man doing brain surgery. Only about 25 of these stones in America. We have three here in our museum. This is one of the actual Ica stones from Peru showing a man and dinosaur together. Some of the stones show uh, amputations, uh, people's legs being amputated and artificial limbs being attached. They show heart surgery. Here are some of the tools that they use for the surgery, for the brain surgery. Uh, Dennis Swift has spent a fortune and a lot of time studying all about the uh, Ica stones. They knew about reshaping the skulls. Here are some strange shaped skulls that they used uh, to, for whatever reason, they would uh, shape the skulls. Ancient man was not primitive. He knew an awful lot, probably more than we do today in many areas. Here's a stone from Ica, Peru, showing what appears to be heart surgery. They're taking the person's heart out. Now, whether that's the soul leaving and the guy died, or I don't know, but they, did, they knew about open heart. Here's one showing an artificial limb, thus amputation. This little thing appears to be designed to be a steam engine. Dennis Swift has a lot of information about that. They knew about the wheel a long time ago. This is from the Ica civilization, many, many thousand, several thousand years ago. This little spider in real life is only an eighth of an inch long, but this is one of the drawings called the Nazca Lines. Notice the leg on the right, the bottom right, has one leg that's much longer than the rest. It looks like, oops, they made a mistake. It was just discovered recently that this little tiny spider, which you cannot see without a magnifying glass, during mating season, just for a few seconds, that leg grows longer it mates off the, the sperm and eggs are on the tip of that leg, and then the leg shrinks back in. How could they have known that without magnification? These uh, metallic spheres found in South Africa have parallel lines going around them, obviously man-made, and yet they're in rocks supposed to be pre-Cambrian. The textbook said it's 2.8 billion years old. <laughs> well, that's baloney. We'll have a whole bunch about this on our website. You can get it from Michael Cremo's books. And of course, he believes it's 2.8 billion. He's wrong about that, but he's right. It's a man-made artifact. Um, <clears throat> this mortar and pestle were found underneath deposits of rock supposed to be three, 33 to 55 million years old under Table Mountain in California. These uh, little, what they're called nano artifacts were found, extremely tiny little uh, coils, some down to one ten thousandth of an inch. How did they carve something like that? How did they make something? How could they see something like that? <clears throat> I suspect they had much better vision, down to extremely uh, fine vision, to be able to see real tiny things, or they certainly knew about magnification techniques. These nano artifacts follow what's called the golden mean ratio. We're going to do a whole videotape on the golden mean ratio. That is absolutely amazing how that the Greeks discovered that, that the thing that's pleasing to the eye is rectangles that are 1 to 1.61 in ratio. That's what the pentagram is all about. And Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse did a cartoon, or Walt Disney did a cartoon about the golden mean ratio called Mathmagic Land, I think is the name of it. That's amazing, showing how the golden mean ratio is found in all sorts of things. It's found in the uh, chambered nautilus, the way that it grows, the length to width of the chambered nautilus follows the golden mean ratio. If you take one and cut it in half, I've got uh, one here, you can see the chambers inside, as it grows, the, the ram's horn does the same thing. A sunflower does the same thing. Even the, the scales on a pine cone follow the golden mean ratio. <coughs> we'll do a whole videotape on that someday. That's amazing. Okay, next topic. 
What about the Great Pyramid? The Great Pyramid is amazing. It is the largest building by far on the surface of the planet. Nobody knows for sure when it was built. There's a lot of theories about it. It's uh, much larger in volume than the Sears Tower. <coughs> there are four theories about the Great Pyramid. Two theories say it's built before the flood. Two theories say it's built after the flood. And then they divide up into two theories say it's built by heathen people. It's just a heathen structure. No big deal. Other people think, no, it's a godly structure and it has symbolism in there for Christianity or for at least for the Lord. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. I'll just share you the four theories with you. The Great Pyramid is a massive building. <coughs> it is built in Egypt. It may be a fulfillment of this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 19. It says, In that day there would be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof. And it shall be a sign and a witness for the Lord. Uh, many people have preached on this. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But Egypt, they say, this pyramid is on the border where the kingdom split and there were two kingdoms feuding. So it's at the border of Egypt, but it's also in the midst thereof once the kingdoms got back together. <coughs> Don't know. Couldn't prove that. The Great Pyramid, here's a schematic drawing of it, showing if you walk in the entrance on the right where the letter, letter A is, you can take the broad way that leads down to the pit, or you can go to the narrow way which leads you into the king's chamber. So here you have the symbolism of the broad way and the narrow way. If you go up the narrow way, you end up into a large section called the Great Grand Gallery. And there are markings along the wall that some people think are actually based on pyramid inches, which actually tells some kind of history of the world. You know, it's got events that came, correspond to major events in world history. It's the largest building by far. <coughs> it contains enough stone to build a brick wall 10 feet high, completely around Texas. Some of the stones in the Great Pyramid weigh 70 tons. The top is 450 feet high. The cap capstone was never installed. The entrance goes down the broad way, or you can turn around and change your direction and go up the narrow way to the king's chamber. In the king's chamber, there's an empty tomb. Apparently, the tests have revealed there's never been a person buried in there. Again, it may be Christian symbolism. I don't know. The pyramid probably was originally covered with 144,000 casing stones that fit together so tightly that you couldn't even find the seams in many cases, and you definitely couldn't put a piece of paper between them. The capstone was never found. <coughs> Revelation 7 tells us there's going to be 144,000 of the children of Israel that are sealed in the book of Revelation. Interesting. 144,000 sealed stones encased the Great Pyramid. So this may be something, Christian symbolism, I don't know. Ephesians talks about the whole body being fitly joined together. Um, Matthew tells about the stone that the builders rejected became the head of the corner. Same thing in Mark chapter 12. The stone which the builders rejected, Luke 20, the stone the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. It could be that the pyramid, if it, if it is a Christian symbol, uh, has the ch cap capstone, the chief cornerstone, not installed because God is telling us he's not done doing his work here yet. Don't know. Preach is good. Maybe true. I wouldn't be dogmatic on it. But the book of Daniel talks about the stone cut out of the mountain without hands that smote the image on the feet, and it became a great kingdom. Some people think that the, the New Jerusalem, which is 1,500 by 1,500 by 1,500, is actually a pyramid because that's the only building that has one cornerstone as opposed to a, a normal buildings which have, would have four cornerstones. A pyramid would have one, and if Jesus is the light of the world, he could be the cornerstone that hasn't been installed yet, and he's going to be the ruler of the world coming soon to a city near you. Of course, Satan has uh, abused this uh, and used the Great Pyramid as the symbol on the back of the $1 bill. It's a symbol for the New World Order. Notice on the $1 bill they show the left eye, uh, which is what is often used in Satan worship, and they have a gap between the eye and the pyramid. This is supposed to be symbolic of the idea that uh, Lucifer has not been installed as the world ruler yet. They're hoping, of course, to get Lucifer installed. And in front it says, uh, Norvus Odo Seclorum, New World Order, New Order of the Ages. This is the symbol for the New World Order. has been on our dollar bill since 1935. In front, there are things growing. In the back, it's desert. How that they're going to bring in their new world order. The 13 lines of stone on the Great Pyramid here apparently represent the 13 degrees of the Masonic Lodge. And that's all ties in. We cover more on that on video number five. Okay, next question. <clears throat> Was the earth ever a hot molten mass? Textbooks will say, as the earth formed, the surface was similar to the moon. Craters like in the picture and large plains of volcanic basalt may have marked its surface. But unlike the moon, Earth's surface was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. That's what the books are teaching the kids in school. The question is, is it true? Well, Genesis 1 tells us God moved upon the face of the waters. 
When God made the earth, it was under water, which means it was not a hot molten mass. Somebody is wrong. So the question is, was the earth hot or was it not hot? Well, let's look at the scientific evidence. Robert Gentry from uh, Knoxville, Powell, Tennessee, near Knoxville, has done great research on radio polonium halos. His website is halos.com if you want to get a hold of Robert Gentry. I've been to his house, seen his laboratory, it's amazing, the stuff he did on radio polonium halos. He discovered in granites all over the world there are little tiny rings. You can't see them without a good microscope, but these rings are sort of like, a best, the best analogy would be if a hand grenade exploded in jello, all the fragments would fly out and be stuck in the, in the jello. If you had a big block of jello, it would make a halo. Well, as polonium decays, it's radioactive. As it decays, it sends off these little particles, and they all go a certain distance. So you end up, just similar to the hand grenade, you end up with a ring of these little particles. If this happens in hot molten rock, it's going to decay, make its little halo, and the halo is going to melt. It's going to disappear. Just like when fireworks go off, it makes a beautiful circle in the sky, and then it doesn't stay there. Of course, it, it falls down. Well, <clears throat> Polonium has a very short half-life, and so if it made its little halo as the polonium decayed and made its little halo in the rock, if the rock was hot, the halo would disappear. If the rock were already cold, it would leave a ring behind. And these rings are found in rock all over the world, and Robert Gentry did a lot of research on this and said, folks, these rocks were never a hot molten mass because this is polonium that is original. It's not a daughter product of something else and let, it's leaving a ring behind. This rock was never hot. And as soon as his research, people began to realize his research goes against the Big Bang Theory, they, he lost his funding, of course. <clears throat> okay, next question. What about global warming? Is it true the Earth is heating up and we've got to save the environment and you know, save Mother Earth and kill all, the whale, or kill all the babies and save all the whales? Well, there's a good book, several good books about, about uh, uh, global warming. I think there's a whole lot more to this story than we realize. There's no question man has abused the environment, okay, but I don't think the government's the one to fix it. Um, there's a book called Facts Not Fear. You can get through Derry Brownfield's ministry in uh, Missouri. Radio uh, R12, which is what's used in refrigerants for air conditioners, it sinks. It doesn't rise. Try it. If you can get some R12 and poke a little hole in the can and put a match under it, it'll put the match out as it flows over it. It's not going up. Um, a volcano can produce thousands of times more ozone-destroying material than man has produced in the history of our, of our, of our mo 